Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Rethinking Milwaukee's Infrastructure, the Challenges and Opportunities. My name is Megan Snell, and I am the president of the Association of Equipment Manufacturers. We're the North American-based international trade group. We represent off-road equipment manufacturers and their suppliers. We have more than 1,000 member companies, and they represent over 200 product lines in the agriculture and construction-related sectors worldwide. Our industry does support 2.8 million family-sustaining American jobs, and we contribute $288 billion a year to the U.S. economy. Our headquarters is actually just a few short miles away from here. We are in the historic former home of the Alice Chalmers Manufacturing, and before that, I can't help it, I call it the Chase Building. We used to be right downtown. Among our work hosting and operating international trade shows, AEM has several initiatives geared towards furthering conversations at the intersection of policy and infrastructure, including Infrastructure Vision 2050. Infrastructure Vision 2050 is AEM's policy-oriented thought leadership initiative focused on crafting and supporting the implementation of a long-term national vision for U.S. infrastructure. Since 2014, Infrastructure Vision has helped develop innovative, transformative policy solutions for our country's infrastructure needs. This includes partnering with institutions such as Northwestern University, Cornell University, and I know we have a current Cornell student, Amy, nice to see you, and Iowa State University to support an optimistic vision for how to build a modern, sustainable, and equitable infrastructure for all Americans. Most recently, we partnered with the Brookings Institution to support their April 2021 report, Rebuild with Purpose, an affirmative vision for 21st century American infrastructure. The purpose of this groundbreaking report was to recommend shared priorities for a forward-looking national vision, justify them with rigorous research, and use those priorities to craft high-level strategies to inform policy change. As our elected officials turn their focus to the implementation of the infrastructure bill, the report will serve as an important roadmap for a transparent and efficient process. A lot of buzzwords in there, but they're all very key. Today's event will feature a two-part discussion. We're going to start off with a fireside or a waterside chat between Mayor Cavalier Johnson and Brookings Institution's Amy Liu, where they will explore how lawmakers can leverage new federal funding opportunities to design infrastructure projects and programs that advance sustainability and economic opportunity for everyone. We will then hear from a great lineup of private and public sector experts who will discuss how they are leveraging investments in infrastructure to address persistent challenges and build strong, prosperous, and resilient communities. And last but not least, at the end of the second panel, we invite you all to join us for a cocktail reception to connect with the panelists or each other and continue the conversation. With that, I will now ask you to join me in giving a very warm welcome to our very own Mayor Cavalier Johnson. Mayor Johnson. to be back here in Milwaukee and to be with you in this gorgeous space. Um, and I want to thank our colleagues at AEM for uh, hosting us and bringing us here for this really important conversation about the future of infrastructure and what it means for a community as important as Greater Milwaukee. And one of the reasons why I do think we have to have this conversation, why it's so important, is even though uh, the Congress and the administration um, passed a historic infrastructure law and bill uh, totaling $864 billion once in a generation, the real result of that is going to come down to state and local vision and action, and hence why this conversation with you, Mayor, uh, is so important. Um, first, I want to say congratulations to you. Thank you. It's great to see you. Um, Megan, uh, well, I'm just going to get started. 
Um, Megan talked about this report that uh, Brookings put together. It was authored by my colleague, Adi Tomer, who you'll uh, meet in just a moment. Uh, he and his team uh, put out a paper called Rebuild with Purpose. And one of the reasons why I think Adi and the team uh, put this paper together uh, with support of AEM was because even though we were having a major national conversation about infrastructure, it was really important that we just didn't rebuild the same kind of infrastructure. That we had to recognize that the world had fundamentally changed and that this once in a generation investment needed to advance a future vision of our communities and of our nation. And in, the, in that paper, uh, you'll see ideas about the fact that a lot of this is, is about how infrastructure can respond to things like the changing nature of the environment and climate and resilience the rise of digitalization in our economy and how digitalization also matters to workers and businesses and as infrastructure. The importance of workers in the infrastructure sector um, and how all of these things can advance equity and opportunity and wealth creation for our, our residents. Um, so this is my question for you. Um, when you think about infrastructure, um, what's the purpose you would like it to advance here in Milwaukee. Well, first of all, thank you, uh, Amy, and thank you, Brookings, and everybody for being here today for this fireside chat. It's very moist for a fireside chat, and I appreciate that. Um, and second of all, I did not dress down today, so I apologize for not wearing a tie. I was donating blood, so I needed a, I needed a shirt with some sleeves I could roll up. Um, I think I'm on my, my, my 45th blood donation. I've been doing it since high school, so shout out to all the blood donors out there. Yeah. Um, it's important. It's important. Um, but to the question about infrastructure, I mean, you, you said it yourself, right? We need to make sure that we build infrastructure that does not just repeat what we had in the past, but a new vision for infrastructure. And I talk about this all the time. I talked about it when I was campaigning for the office of mayor, is that we need to have people-centered development. That includes our investments on the public side in our infrastructure, right? I want to have infrastructure investment at the local level that is people-centered, that helps to drive vibrancy and vitality in neighborhoods, that attracts private sector um, investments to come after that so that we can build neighborhoods across our entire city. You know, folks in this room probably are not, uh, uh, you know, they probably are aware, rather, that, you know, I've talked about wanting to grow the population of the city of Milwaukee. I don't want us to be a city that nibbles around the edges near 600,000 people. I want to grow this city to a population of a million people or more. Um, but the only way that we're going to do that is if we have the infrastructure that's able to back it up. And that's why I want to see people-centered development across Milwaukee. So that means not having uh, uh, streets that are these wide open roadways that are conducive to things like reckless driving, which we see in a community. Uh, I want to see more curb extensions, more bus, more bump outs, more bus bulbs to accommodate public transit. I want to see more uh, elevated and protected bike lanes, you know, things that encourage people to walk. Um, because when you have people out there, when you have that pedestrian sort of activity, that encourages, again, vibrancy uh, and dynamism in cities. That's what helps to draw people. That's what helps to draw businesses. That's what helps to grow cities. And that's what I want to see. And you, spent, you mentioned a lot about um, transportation opportunities. And I think that's absolutely right. One of the things I want to remind everyone is the infrastructure bill covers a lot of other sectors. And again, Adi and the team put out something called the um, Federal Infrastructure Hub. If you haven't taken a look at it, please do, because it breaks down all the different kinds of available investments uh, in the bill. And what you'll see is it has everything from transportation to water sewer to broadband to um, coastal resilience and other sort of uh, resilience projects. And so um, huge opportunities to think about um, ways to deploy infrastructure in the vision that you talk about. So I, I guess my follow-up question then is to get a little bit more specific about the projects. And there's also something that we, you know, a DNR team talk a lot about is it's really easy with infrastructure to talk about this in terms of projects and deals. And, um, but with unprecedented investments, there's an opportunity to think bigger, multi-sector, larger scale. Um, because we don't get this opportunity that much, you know, and it's not a knock on curb cuts, but, you know, if we have unprecedented resources, do we invest like bigger, more, more structural change 
uh, more ambitious projects? What would that look like? So I guess one of the things I want to ask you is, do you have a set of ambitions around water or broadband or transportation or others that can that you have in mind or you think is possible here in this community that advances your vision of a people-centered economy? Yes, yeah, yeah, I do. Um, but I think it's, it's important for a city like Milwaukee to have a balance, yeah. right? Um, of course, I wanna see, like I said, a, a, a thoroughly fleshed out, accessible bicycle network throughout the city, right? We have uh, transit system here. The buses are operated by Milwaukee County, but you know the city has some ability to be able to better accommodate um, the county and its bus system. That's why I talked about you know bus bulbs, which would also help to slow some of that traffic down to mitigate the effects of reckless driving. Right, so that's important. Just last week there was a a storm that rolled through, and I was on the way to pick up my my uh, four year old daughters, my twins from from camp, and the streets. Um, near the near the park where they were um, were basically a river, right? And so that's why we need to work with our partners, not just in the city, but in the sewerage district and others, to make sure we capture more water where it falls, right? So that we can be prepared for the effects of a changing climate. Um, it's also important as well, you know, for us to, to to keep in mind that in a city like Milwaukee, we've got some serious challenges that just have not been met over time. We've got streetlights um, in this community that are World War II era, that need to be upgraded, that need to be replaced. You know, we've got issues where we haven't been able to adequately invest uh, in our roadway. So if we talk about rebuilding them, uh, that's one thing, and rebuilding them with people in mind, but we need to, like, we, we need to just be able to be in the position to improve them so the folks who are driving on our streets uh, don't end up in a situation where you know, they're wrecking their cars because they're hitting uh, potholes. Um, and as you touched on, you know, the, the, the water services, sewer and water services, we've got you know, 70,000 lead service laterals in Milwaukee, like half of the, the total uh, in, the, in, the, in the entire state of Wisconsin right here. And so we've got to address those things as well. So we've got to have a mix of big, bold uh, ideas, but we also have to you know, keep in mind you know, the very serious uh, problems that we've had consistently over decades in the city and addressing those things as well. And so that you bring up another um, theme that was really important for us. I think the AEM team uh, took this conversation on the road and was recently in Nashville. And we're here in Milwaukee because it's really important to think about the importance of infrastructure when it comes to older industrial cities. Um, and there's unique challenges here. And I think you, I hear you talking about some of the historic challenges here in Milwaukee. You know, when we think about infrastructure in the context of older cities in the Midwest, um, the challenges are different. You know, we have, you know, an economy that continues to diversify, although I keep hearing that manufacturing is doing really well here, which is great. But we still need to continue to diversify and uh, create a more dynamic economy. We have, in a city like Milwaukee, still um, multi-generational poverty and racial segregation. And then it was what you were saying, just a lot of underinvestment and legacy infrastructure, aging infrastructure which makes prioritization hard. Talk about like, what, are, what do you think are the unique um, infrastructure needs in a community like Milwaukee because of that history? Um, and you know, how do you think about the balance between not only big and small, but new and legacy? Yeah, I, I think about it in terms of, in terms of equity, right? Because it, while it may not be you know, this, this sexy thing to talk about in terms of street lights, but really, you know, if, if the lights are working in more prosperous communities uh, in the city, those that hug the lake from, you know, the east side, you know, to downtown, to Walker's Point, to Bayview, um, but they're not on in some of our legacy neighborhoods on the, the north side uh, or on the near south side, then that's, that, that's a problem, right? Um, street lights are, are fine for, uh, for tourism uh, and for entertainment purposes, but they're also a public safety, you know, concern as well. And so they've got to be on, not just in those sort of neighborhoods, but they've got to be on 
in the neighborhoods that are outside of you know, the, the, the locations where tourists come as well, right? These people who make the city go uh, every single day um, by virtue of their jobs. Um, so we've, we've gotta make sure that we have an equity lens and focus when we're talking about making these sort of investments and that's why it's so critically important that we have a balance. Um, we talk about you know, these, these, these sort of investments that'll come from the, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act and, and the ARPA funds that have come down uh, in the past, whether to the city, to the county, uh, or to the state level. We gotta make sure that we're investing it um, in the places where it makes the most sense. Um, so for big projects, yeah, I wanna see that and I wanna make those sort of investments, but at the same time too, uh, it's also critically important that we're looking out for the people in the neighborhoods and we're able to provide the critical services that all those folks, whether you're a, a resident of this city, whether you're a, a commuter to the city coming in from suburban communities to work every day, whether you're a visitor uh, to Milwaukee, everybody has a level of service that they expect and deserve and we need to be able to, to be, be able to meet that. So I know that you're not gonna be able to achieve this by yourself, as powerful as you are. No. <laughs> so, That's why Lafayette's here. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I think that the needs of this community, like many communities around the country, is gonna outstrip the resources that you have. Um, for as much as there's unprecedented set of investments, we still need to prioritize. And prioritizing is actually a really hard act. In fact, it requires probably community input, engagement. You've got folks here in the room who represent foundations, nonprofits, the civic community, the business community. How do you intend to engage with your community partners on like, how do you prioritize what matters most? Well, I'm, I'm glad you, you said that because no, I as one person cannot do it. Um, and no one person or one entity can do it. Um, so it's critically important to do what I consistently have talked about uh, in the time that I've been mayor, which is work in partnerships, work in teams. And I know that you know, Tim Sheehy from the uh, MMAC is here and the MMAC has been a great partner the business community has been a great partner in our attempts to work with the state government, uh, Governor Evers, as well as uh, the legislature that's controlled by Republicans to convince them of the importance of investing in Milwaukee, right? It, where Milwaukee goes, the state will go. And so disinvestment in Milwaukee is really in the long run a disinvestment and a harm to the state. And so we need everybody to step up and to be a part of the solution here. So. I often tell folks, especially if um, you're a business leader and you've got concerns about issues happening in Milwaukee, even if you don't live here, and especially if you don't live here, you're in a really powerful position. Why is that? It's because the communities that you live in, you're probably represented by somebody who's in the majority in the state senate or the state assembly, right? So if you're their constituent and you do business in Milwaukee, you come to Milwaukee, you know the importance of Milwaukee, they're more likely to listen to you. So help us to push the dial. Help us to convince them to get more resources to Milwaukee so that we can deliver the services that you expect and you deserve, all right? We're talking about public safety. Uh, we're talking about you know, the general services when you're coming in uh, during you know, months that we don't want to talk about around here because the, the, the weather like this doesn't last as long as we would like, but it gets cold here and it snows, you know, you know having the snow to be, to be plowed and those things. We need to be able to deliver those services, but we can't do that if we just don't have the revenue to do it. Um, and the only folks who have the powers to help us out with that uh, are the legislators, are the, the powers that be, the political forces that be in Madison. So help us make that pitch. Um, again, it, you know, the MMAC has been a great partner there. You, know, you can contact my office, you can contact uh, Tim Sheehy and that group and work with us to bring the revenues back home so we can make these sort of investments that folks care about in this community. So I'm gonna just um, go deeper on the state piece because that is a really important element of this. Uh, one of the things that Adi and his colleagues found is that 76% of the federal infrastructure funds actually flow through states. And that includes transportation dollars, the water sewer dollars, dollars, the broadband dollars, all flow through states first before they get distributed out to local jurisdictions. So that partnership with the state actually matters quite a bit to achieving the ambitions that you laid out. Um, talk about your current relationship with the state and the state legislature. Um, and you talked a little bit about this already about your approach, but 
what are the prospects, do you think, of a good state and local collaboration around your infrastructure agenda? Um, I, I, well, in terms of uh, ARPA, in, in terms of the American Rescue Plan allocations, um, d depending on the state, the, the process is different. Here, um, our governor has unilateral authority over ARPA. So it doesn't even need to go through a legislative process. He can simply dole out you know, money that fits within the guidelines as he sees fit. So that has been a benefit to us in a sense because when there's been need for public safety uh, issues and so many other issues, uh, Governor Tony Evers has been there to, to, to help us out. Um, in terms of my relationship with the state, look, I've got a great working relationship with Governor Tony Evers. Uh, uh, we have and, and we'll continue to do that. Um, on the Republican side, unfortunately, uh, you know, there's been this contentious relationship between the city of Milwaukee and the state government. I ran on a campaign to change that, to work to change that, by putting my best foot forward to do that, and I am so completely sincere about doing it. Um, and this is, you know, chief of the reason why, is because we've, for far too long in this, in this city, in this state, in this nation, we've gotten so far apart when really the vast majority of people are somewhere in the middle. You know, I, I think that the people who elected me to this office expect me to deliver something, not to sit here and be you know, in a partisan fight. So I can either work with the powers that be, be a political realist and understand that the Republicans control the legislature half for, for a decade now and probably will for the foreseeable future, um, and work with them and get something done, or I can you know, shake my fist at Madison and get nothing done. I choose to get something done. Um, and I think that legislators in Madison, especially on the Republican side, they see that, they appreciate that, and they have been willing to engage. Now, have we gotten everything that I've asked for? Look, I've only been mayor elected at least you know, since April, so uh, you know, time will tell, but uh, we're actively working at it. Um, in the last two weeks ago, I had Speaker Robin Voss uh, in my office, and I, I asked my chief of staff before he walked in, I said, you know, Jim, I I wonder when the last time Robin Voss was in the mayor's office. <laughs> and then Robin walked in the office and he you know, came and shook my hand. He said, oh my God, this is the first time I've been in the mayor's office. <laughs> yeah, you know, so, so we're building those relationships. And I'm glad that he came and I visited him in his office you know, earlier in the year as well. Two weeks prior to, to Speaker Voss um, being present uh, in my office, I had uh, Devin Lemahieu, the, 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 the leader in the state Senate uh, on the Republican side. Uh, in the mayor's office as well. And I, I presume that it hasn't happened in some time that a Republican leader on the Senate side has been in the mayor's office too. So I'm actively working to build those relationships. And I will continue to do that because it is in the best interest of the city of Milwaukee. It's in the best interest of the citizens of the city of Milwaukee. And I understand, I understand, I get this, that a stronger, a safer, and more prosperous Milwaukee means a stronger, safer, and more prosperous region means a stronger, safer, and more prosperous Wisconsin, and that's what I want to get to. I, I actually hope you're really, you're right, and one of the things that we've at least observed here in Washington from our perch in Washington is, you know, what was exciting about that infrastructure bill was that it was applauded for being a bipartisan bill, and it was a lot of support from Republicans in the House and Senate joining the Democrats in getting the bill done. And the hope is that we can also see bipartisan spirit continue through implementation. Um, I'm going to turn it over to you for questions in just a moment. So start thinking about the questions you want to ask the mayor. Um, I'll just close with this. I know you spent some time working with the um, workforce board. And one of the things that we also want to remind people is that all of these investments that we're going to make in a future-oriented, people-centered infrastructure is going to require workers. And at a time where we're thinking about equity and opportunity, there's a, and you know, a lot of churn in the labor market, there's a huge opportunity to use this to be also a path for job creation. Um, do you have plans, or what's your experience about thinking about the role of infrastructure investments in job training and, 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 the, uh, and the community and workers here in the city? Look, I, I, I want, I, I, I want to have more stability in Milwaukee. I think that's one of the one of the key pieces that we're missing uh, in this in this community is stability. And I look back at Milwaukee of the past. You know, folks may be aware that in this city, um, 
when we had a, a high volume of heavy manufacturing jobs available, in Milwaukee we had the highest quality of life for African Americans in the United States. And when those jobs dried up in those neighborhoods, when they went to right to work states in the South or they went overseas for cheap labor, um, and those jobs dried up, those neighborhoods, the people in them, uh, they got stuck in this, 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 this problem. They got mired in poverty, which then leads to violence. And the things that we turn on the 10 o'clock news and we see, and we shake our heads and we wonder why, is because we've lost the stability that jobs, and particularly manufacturing jobs, um, provided in neighborhoods like that. And so, yeah, I've got experience working in uh, workforce development, and I see the opportunities in infrastructure, uh, on our roads, with building out, uh, you know, the bike, bicycle network that I was talking about, um, with uh, investments in other infrastructure as well, like water and sewer and replacing those lead service lines, as an opportunity to train folks to get better access back into the workforce. You know, I, I often tout uh, as well that, you know, there's a 44-story, a, a um, you know, luxury tower that's going up downtown, um, and that may be good for the people who are living there at the end, um, but building that tower, you know, it's gonna take a million construction hours, and 400,000 of those hours at least are gonna go to people who live in the neighborhoods I grew up in, the hard-hit neighborhoods in Milwaukee, giving them an access point to an economy and a good-paying job. So when it comes to to jobs and job training, whether it's manufacturing, whether it's um, uh, uh, the trades, whether it's technology, green jobs, my answer is yes, 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 all the above. I want to see it all. Okay, it is your turn. Uh, anyone with questions for the mayor? Well, Karen waves her mic. I answered them all. <laughs> oh, whoops, I failed. Look at that. Going to introduce yourself. Yeah. Uh, Wade Belconis with the Association of Equipment Manufacturers and left the city for 10 years, came back and got a house on Brady Street. So I'm as invested as you are in, in what happens to the city. Um, curious with the streetcar, seems like a pretty easy thing to point to. Look at infrastructure investment and jobs ask, look at the opportunity to get some of the um, federal funds, whether it's through grants, Tiger grants, other things. What are the opportunities the city sees, especially in this bucket of infrastructure funding, to move that streetcar project further, to get it into the underserved communities, to get it up MLK and down to the Fifth Ward. What is your vision for where that goes? Um, thank you. Now, I, I don't think, and maybe somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, um, I don't think that we've gotten the first part of the money yet. But what I will tell you about my vision for the streetcar is this. Um, I think that the streetcar ought to be expanded. Um, I think that having it in the, con in the position where it is now only fulfills what the detractors were saying in the first place. That was never the, the vision for the streetcar, for it to simply be a downtown only utility. So do I want it to go into the neighborhoods? Yes, I think it makes absolute and total sense uh, for it to go past the Deer District um, and go up King Drive and go to Bronzeville. I think it makes sense for it to be extended uh, into the east side and go uh, over to UW-Milwaukee. I think it makes sense for it to go um, you know, into the south side, Walker's Point, potentially down to the airport and other parts beyond that. I think it makes sense to complete the, the loop around uh, in the Couture, down near the lakefront and Summerfest. There are opportunities to expand the streetcar to create jobs for folks, uh, both constructing it uh, and in-use jobs, uh, in it as well. It was never meant to be just a downtown only utility. And for the detractors, you know, I, I, I think about it like this. Um, when you look at the, the federal highway system, nobody snapped their fingers and then you had a network that went from coast to coast in one day. It took time to build that out, right? And that's exactly what's happening here too. There, there will be more, more usefulness and more benefit to the streetcar when it is expanded and extended into neighborhoods, and that's what ought to happen. Thank you so much. Congratulations, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, I am uh, wanting to both affirm and uh, also ask a question. I'm a member of the city-county task force on climate and economic equity. 
And we have been working, even with all the COVID challenges, really hard to come up with ideas that are smart, both on the issues of climate change, but also equity in workforce. One of the things that you mentioned, of course, was uh, the street lights. That was one of the things that's come up in our report, getting LED lights and so on. But um, in addition, one of the things that's excited me has been some of the proposals to deal with modular housing, where in a city like Milwaukee, where it's sometimes not very easy to work outside to do construction, there are now really energy, high energy efficiency ways to build affordable housing using modular housing. So we, your office, ECO, um, is exploring some of this right now. I just wanted to make sure that you know how much we're excited about this. I want us to just be able to really thrive, not just survive. And uh, I think that combining the issues that people experience in their daily lives on the health, like the lead laterals, along with energy retrofits, is a huge win. And I know the city has so many competing needs for the money, but I'm excited that under your leadership and um, with the Common Council and the county, I'm really excited to see how we can use these dollars to push way ahead. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And I can guarantee you that uh, uh, Eric Schombarger uh, in our eco office, who I, I know that you know uh, and who is in the audience right now, um, thank you, Eric, for being here, um, is an advocate and is not just uh, letting it sit on the shelf. <laughs> he constantly reminds me of the importance of that and so many other um, issues as well that come out of that, that task force. So, so keep up the good work. Sorry, you're going to hear from me again. Uh, Megan Tunnell with AEM. I'm going to go up the workforce route and a little something that I heard Tim say last night. We were at an orientation for MMAC and he was talking about graduation rates in uh, MPS and then those that go to college and then those that actually then graduate from a two or four year. And, you know, you kept saying two and four year and I understand that's a focus for Milwaukee, but we've got great job opportunities in, in the trades, right? A tech school, it doesn't have to be two or four years. Just to the west of you, Wauwatosa, 100% college focused, like kids go to school there and if they're not going to college, they feel ostracized. There's gotta be a way to help the kids in Milwaukee you know they don't have to go to a four year school. Here's a great, like I said, family supporting jobs, right? And then we have a manufacturer in here, Komatsu. You know, Komatsu Mining is that beautiful facility. Thank you for being here in Milwaukee. How are we gonna bring more manufacturers here if we don't have the workforce? So I'm, I'm asking a little bit, you know, I guess it's not really a question, and maybe it's a statement. You want to push towards university, but yet we need workers. What can we do about that? that that's a great question, and I'm so pleased that the, the folks from Komatsu are here as well. I had the opportunity to join them uh, just, just a few weeks ago. Maybe it was longer than that, so I got a mind blur <laughs> um, from being mayor, I think. Um, so I visited with them recently. Uh, I'll be joining them again. Uh, and look, I, I talk about this always. I think the, uh, the question you brought up is is a great one. You know, I went I went to college. You know, I went to the University of Wisconsin. I, I graduated and became the first person in my family to do that. Um, that's good for me. You know, hooray for me. But it wasn't that wasn't the path for my brother or several of my brothers or cousins. But they still need an opportunity to support themselves and to support their families, right? And so I constantly am saying in this community, we need to, we've been sleeping on this opportunity in manufacturing as well as in the trades, and we really need to wake up to it. That's why just yesterday, uh, I was up at one of the union halls uh, in Milwaukee, and they had kids from schools all over the city, all over the city, um, talking to them about the great career opportunities that are available in uh, the trades, and I want to support that. I worked with Milwaukee Public Schools just a couple of months ago um, and introduced to them opportunities to work in the trades as well. We put on this, this trade fair, uh, apprenticeship trade fair, and we had you know, over 250 young people from Milwaukee Public Schools who I assume didn't even consider, don't even know about the opportunities here, right? And so as mayor, I'm gonna continue beating the drum and trying to wake this community up to the fact that you don't have to go to a four-year university in order to have a quality life. You just don't. 
And I know there's this, this myth that really needs to be busted, and I'll say it here, I'll continue to say it, that manufacturing is no longer uh, encompassed by the, the three Ds of being dark and dangerous and dirty. When I visited the Komatsu facility recently, it was, I said, you know, it's so clean in here, um, you know, I wish my son would come in here and check it out so he knows what his room should look like. <laughs> so, so it, it's completely different than what it was years ago. And to boot, you have the opportunity to get family supporting jobs out of it that help to stabilize individuals, help to stabilize their families, which helps to stabilize their neighborhoods, stop the neighborhoods from being so porous, stops the people from being so transient, and that's how you get to the greater public safety that all of us want to see. All of this stuff is interconnected. You, know, you can see the, the web linkages, uh, but we've got to make sure that there's access and we've got to make sure that people know. And I'm gonna be a cheerleader for that as long as I'm in this seat as mayor. Yeah, please do, thank you. Need all the voices that we can. I guess I would just um, use this opportunity to, to say that Adi and his colleague, uh, Joe Kane and others have written a series of case studies uh, through blogs and others on the Brookings Metro website about uh, promising examples of this in other cities around the country. And you know, New Jersey has a great um, effort there where young people are part of a conservation core and begin to get exposed to do jobs around parks cleanup and brownfield remediation as part of an infrastructure environmental justice effort. DC Mayor Bowser has a job training program um, getting um, apprenticeships and employer partnerships through the utility sector and green building sectors um, to get you know, young people and college students into these jobs. Um, so again, huge opportunities here. And I, you know, it's also want to remind people too that the infrastructure jobs aren't just construction oriented. Um, we need workers that plan, that design, that maintain, that build the systems across all of these different sectors. So there's so many employer partnerships that are possible here too. So I think it's really exciting. Yeah, and, and I, I would say one you know, final point on this as well. So earlier this week, Right, we, we worked with our workforce development agency, Employ Milwaukee, to launch what's called, what we are, are calling Camp Rise. And so we're engaging younger youth. We're engaging kids between 10 and 15 years old, typically who are left out of opportunities to participate in the Summer Youth Jobs Program, right? So I would encourage manufacturers and businesses generally to work with the school district, and not even just with Milwaukee Public Schools, right, with uh, other great school uh, education providers in this city too, to reach you know, out to, to, to young people and their families at a younger age. Too often we wait until you know, young people are set in their ways. As a teenager at you know, 10th, 11th grade, they're, they're kind of set in their ways, and not that they can't you know, go on a different path, certainly they can, but let's get them younger. Let's get them when uh, their minds are more open to to change and new possibilities. We can do this, we can do this together by presenting opportunities and giving them exposure. Too often in a city like this, you know, if you're a young black or Latino male, you know, you live just a couple of miles away from Lake Michigan, you don't even see the lake until you're a teenager. I can attest to this, I know it, right? Um, that's because it's a lack of exposure. You know, too many kids, your life is in basically a, a, a block, it, it's, it's like a city block with four points, right? You got home, you got school, you got corner store, you got a relative's house, that's your whole world. So we need to make sure that we expose our young, our young people in this community to the opportunities that are there. And by reaching out to schools and doing it at a younger age, we can help them to understand what the opportunities are for their future. Well, unfortunately, we're gonna have to move on to the next section, and I just wanna first thank you for your just human-centered and pragmatic leadership Please join me in thanking the mayor for joining us today. Hi, everybody. My name's Austin Ramirez. I'm the CEO of Husco. We are a manufacturing company headquartered out in Waukesha. I'm also a member of the AEM board, and I'm the chair of the Infrastructure 2050 Vision Task Force. And I want to start by thanking Amy and Mayor Johnson for a great panel. That was terrific. And, and Mayor Johnson, in particular, your comments about bipartisanship and reaching out to the folks in Madison. I mean, infrastructure is not partisan. Br bridges aren't red or blue. 
And we've got a lot of work beyond just infrastructure that isn't partisan. And I really applaud your, your sentiments and your efforts to build those bridges and, and work on solving problems. So thank you and Godspeed in the work. Just to, to pick up on another theme, we talked a lot about manufacturing, more about manufacturing in that last panel than I expected. And one of the amazing things about infrastructure is that it's really, it's, it's investment, right? It's federal and state investment, both in the sense that we get left with these assets that are productive and make our communities safer and more productive, but also in the sense that investments in infrastructure drive manufacturing, right? If you want to build infrastructure, you need the heavy equipment, you need the asphalt and aggregate and the steel rebar, you need the hydraulic control valves that Husco manufactures, you need the people to actually operate that equipment and, 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 and build the infrastructure itself. So those investments really funnel back into our economy in a major way, and I think that sometimes gets lost in the discussions about infrastructure. Um, one of the themes that came out in that last panel was this notion of how do we trade off the immediate needs that we have to repair the infrastructure that's kind of crumbled around us because of years and decades of underinvestment versus how do we craft this vision for a really exciting, forward-looking, innovative infrastructure network, not just transportation, but broadband and water and, and all the other types of infrastructure that we need in this country. And I know that Adi has thought a little bit about this and we've got this generational opportunity where we've got both the American Rescue Plan dollars that have some impact on infrastructure and this really massive amount of spending that got approved for the Infrastructure and Jobs Act. You know, I, I hope we continue to see big investments like this, but right now we've got an opportunity that we haven't had in a generation to really reinvest uh, in Milwaukee and Wisconsin and America's infrastructure. And I think this next panel is going to tease that out a little bit. How are we going to think about restoring the broken stuff versus really crafting a vision for the exciting new things that we need. So with that, I'm gonna invite Adi to the stage to introduce our next panel and I'm excited to hear what they have to say. Good afternoon. How's everyone doing? Good, good. First of all, as an out-of-towner, I really want to thank you all for the weather today. Um, I'm not sure if it's for us or the beginning of Summerfest, but we really appreciate uh, everything being so kind and gentle out there. Uh, I work in Washington, D.C., but I'm actually also a resident of the Great Lakes on the Far East Side in Cleveland, Ohio, so I know how wonderful this time of year is. So thank you for also just being willing to be inside at this time of year on a, on a day like this, too. Um, again, my name is Adi Tomer. I'm the person that probably sounded like gibberish when Amy was saying my name, but I am a real person. Uh, I work at the Brooks Institution in Washington, D.C. Um, and this stuff is really my passion, and it's really exciting to have an incredibly dynamic set of leaders here in Milwaukee that, honestly, I, I'm going to introduce in a second, but I don't need to introduce to almost any of you. So I am excited to have a front row seat to their conversation. Um, I just want to kind of put because as a moderator, I like to really be someone who stays out of the way, so I'm just gonna take a minute at the beginning to set some context here uh, at the beginning. You know, Amy mentioned um, this work we've done called Rebuild with Purpose, which we purposely did uh, when, um, no pun intended, when we knew, uh, had a sense, I'm, I'm looking for my colleague Kip, I, I know he's here somewhere, but who's very active um, um, in, uh, in Washington, D.C., where you could, you could sense something big was coming, right? You folks probably know it, you know, either in, in the city of Milwaukee or at the county or at the state level, but you can feel when something big is coming and something big came. Um, but this bill alone is not gonna solve all our challenges. Um, and so I wanna kinda, it, Amy already introduced some of the topic areas that we, we've done in some of our recent work, but I wanna just give you kind of three single stats to put in your head, because sometimes that helps to kind of calcify it for me. Um, so the first one on the environment. In the 1980s, um, our average annual losses from extreme weather events, this is an in inflation adjusted terms for you know, uh, modern times, was $18 billion per year, again, across the country. By the 2010s, not the decade we're in now, the one we already finished, the average, literally the numbers flipped 
to $81 billion per year in average losses, right? That's Hurricane Harvey in Houston, right? Wildfires in California. The danger is real, it is here now. We have seen tragically, as probably many of us have experienced either as kids or as adults, the time out in Yellowstone, right? That, that um, our, our natural treasures, are, are, there are real problems out there. Uh, second, on digitalization. We talk all the time about opportunity. There are 17 million households, some of whom live right here in the city of Milwaukee, the county of Milwaukee, and across the state of Wisconsin that do not have broadband in their home. I would venture that probably everyone in this room, some of you look in them right now, and I'm not offended, the opposite, my boss is doing it. I'm saying we, we have both mobile internet and we probably have it in our home. Think about it, you have two services, 17 million households do not have any of those services, right? And a third number, um, and again, both the mayor and Amy mentioned this in, in an amazing comment, set of comments too, um, there are 14 million jobs in infrastructure. And that is, as Amy mentioned too, the vast minority of those are actually in construction. It's, it's folks working in manufacturing on the shop floor. It's folks helping to maintain our systems. It's bus drivers, right? It's folks working on our water and sewer systems. So there are a ton of jobs out there in this. And as those first two points talked about, the need is gigantic and it's across the entire country and certainly in communities like Milwaukee. So, I'm gonna stop, I'm gonna to turn to a conversation to introduce how this is all playing out in Milwaukee. And critically here, I don't wanna give away the ending because I think we'll see organically where the conversation goes, but the whole point of this group that we brought together is to show how much infrastructure touches every part of the community. And it, it is something that everyone touches in every day. And we have, again, an amazing set of panelists here. So uh, I'm gonna go down the kind of line here, but again, most of you probably already know these folks. Lafayette Crump is the Commissioner of City Development in the city of Milwaukee with a extensive career in helping people specifically in diversity and inclusion. I was impressed to see the work that went on right just right in the arena, something I see on TV right outside of Milwaukee, your incredible work there. So thanks for that. And Lafayette does amazing work outside of just his job in, in, in kind of board style leadership roles in the community, so thank you. Um, Kevin Schaefer is the executive director of the Milwaukee Metropolitan Sewerage District for over 20 years, which is an incredible set of leadership. And I, I really love the staff. They do some of the best processing anywhere in the country on make sure I get the number right, 411 square miles of service area, right? It's enormous, so thank you for your leadership. Then to his left and continuing down the line, Catherine Dunn is the Senior Vice President and Chief Strategy Officer of the Greater Milwaukee Foundation, where for over 25 years, if my math was right, been doing incredible philanthropic work um, all over the place, even beyond the foundation. No, that, that's leadership, don't think of it, I'm not gonna have that way. And don't worry, I got you beat in one second, because then Tim Sheehy, <laughs> who's been the president of the MMAC uh, since 1993, I'm not gonna give you the number, but you all can do math in this room, uh, has been leading the, the competitiveness of this region from the business side. Um, there's a reason I say those numbers, and again, I'm, 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 I have the worst hairline of anyone up here, so I'm allowed to say this stuff. The, um, what I wanna emphasize, right, is we've got an incredible set of veteran leadership, um, whether in current positions or just working and in, in being in this community. So here's where I wanna start, and we'll actually start with, with, with you, Tim. Um, I wanna talk about the, the vision for, for the city and region, right? The mayor did this, so we're kinda of picking up where they left off, but every individual has a kinda of slightly different vision for, for how they want a place to uh, succeed, what they see in the future, right? So let me start with you, but maybe we can focus on the economic competitiveness of the region. Um, how, what would you like to see Milwaukee succeeding, and what are the kind of physical systems you'd like to see that it can help the, the city and the region get there? Sure, <clears throat> first it's uh, humbling running an organization that's 161 years old. And just to put a vision on that, from our perspective, we wanna make sure that Milwaukee's globally competitive, that we have high value jobs that sustain a vibrant quality of life for all. And you certainly can't achieve that if you don't have an infrastructure that's equally visionary. And so when we think about this, we think about executing through really four pillars. We wanna make sure that we continue to grow, we wanna make sure we have talent, we wanna make sure this community is livable, and we wanna make sure there's an equitable opportunity. So when I think about that in the context of the infrastructure discussion today, and I was talking to a couple of folks earlier about this, the money flowing is clearly unprecedented, but I think we've learned a lot through COVID about how rapidly we can change when we have to. But I, when I think about the infrastructure piece, I was thinking about do we wanna unwind or do we wanna uncork? And I think we want to unwind. 
And, and by that I mean as we move to new ways to spend money and we look at the challenges, whether they're digital, whether it's water, or whether it's our transportation infrastructure, I, I think I want to make sure that we unwind those policies and move in another direction and don't uncork. And so here's what I want to do in terms of, and I'll finish here with an analogy about unwinding versus uncorking. We're talking about um, electric vehicles and the tremendously positive impact they're having on the community. We've got 270 million cars on the road. Two million are electrical vehicles. So if you think about what's going to take to put batteries in place to just support that infrastructure change, um, about 95% of that doesn't really exist, and very little of it exists in the U.S. I think we have one mine producing uh, lithium in the United States. So at the same time we're doing this, and I don't mean to pick on the Biden administration, but he just came out with a policy that makes it very difficult to mine lithium. And so if we're not careful about unwinding this going forward and we just uncork it, um, we're going to lose traction in making some of the infrastructure investments that I think we need to make. Yeah, it's a fair, it's a fair point. Um, Catherine, let's go to you next. Um, the foundation um, is not just an advocate for the community. You, you all are, are investors in the community, too. Um, so talk to us a little bit about how you all are thinking about investing right now and, and how the built environment fits into that. Sure. So um, I, I'm going to start, too, with what do we think about this vision for Milwaukee? And it really is a Milwaukee for all. So what does that mean? Uh, that residents are healthy and prosperous and thriving, not just surviving. Um, so I loved hearing the mayor talk about his vision of an equitable and having an equity lens against some of the investments that they're, they're contemplating. I think the um, piece of the infrastructure that, and I, I said that I would bring this up, is, you know, housing. So we may not, we haven't really talked much about housing as part of the infrastructure at, that we envision. Milwaukee has a shortage of housing for people who live here currently, and the mayor's vision to grow the city to a million people plus, which is amazing, but we have a shortage of more uh, of housing that's affordable and that's quality. And I don't mean subsidized housing in terms of affordability. I mean, for people who make $12 an hour and up, we are 32,000 units short of housing for own ownership and 32,000 units of affordable rental housing short for current population. So when we think about infrastructure, that's what we're prioritizing. That's what we're thinking about along with other ways that we, again, the intersectionality of how residents become prosperous and they become thriving and health equity, those are all the intersections that we're looking at right now, primarily through housing uh, lens. Thank you. No, it, it's absolutely essential. And I think the neighborhood conversation gets right down to it, right? Um, Kevin, let's do this. I mean, you work on infrastructure for a living, but but let's connect it to kind of that macro kind of vision uh, for the region, whether it's focused on environment or something bigger, right? Um, where where do you kind of see the the region hopefully being in, in, in ten plus years or whatever kind of time horizon you got? And again, Kevin Schaefer, uh, Executive Director, of Milwaukee Metropolitan Sewage District. Um, we're really focused on a vision where we have to look at the entire watershed. We can't just look at a city limit or the suburbs. We have to look at an entire watershed because water flows downhill. Everyone that's used water today, and I think everyone here has, um, you know, that water goes somewhere. And what we're trying to focus the discussion on is protecting drinking water for folks, so they'll have that in the future. But we, we've taken a long vision on the, the watershed, saying we need to have climate resilient watersheds moving forward. The climate has changed, it is changing. We're facing that uh, paradigm right now. And so we set this long vision for how do we address water on a watershed scale with climate as the lens. But then we whittle that down to how does that impact the neighborhoods? How does that impact the businesses? How can we improve the, the lives of the people that live here? So we take that long vision, but we build projects incrementally that get us to that vision. But we also um, have to take care of the day to day. I mean, our infrastructure is old like everywhere else. We're trying to replace stuff. At the same time, it's becoming obsolete because the weather's changing. You know, it's just, it's, you're kind of like a hamster on a wheel. You're just running over and over and over again. Yeah, I, I want to come right back to that point, too. Um, uh, but, Commissioner, let's kind of finish with you on, on, the, on the optimism. Um, if it, well, no, no, no. I mean, it's the, um, <laughs> the, um, somebody's been reading my Twitter. There you go. There you go. Um, the, First of all, I don't know if folks in the region 
understand how cool it is to have a, a effectively a city department that bundles the services that you all do. That actually can lead to effectiveness. So um, whether it's economic development, neighborhood revitalization, um, and even just urban planning, right? How are you thinking about, and your team, thinking about the future of the region, in the city in particular? Sure. Well, thank you, and it's good to be here, uh, as everyone said. Thank you to Brookings. Thank you to, I'm, I'm going to get the acronym wrong. Thank you to AEM <laughs> for uh, ha having us here today. And, you know, when I, when I think about the future of this city, um, you know, I was struck by the, the folks on this panel that they all lead organizations, and some people may not be aware of it, but that are heavily focused on equity in this region. Um, you know, the MMAC leading their region, region of choice initiative um, that's really brought together, um, you know, a, a number of corporate, what are you at, over 200 maybe? 127. Okay, 120,000 employees, um, you know, companies representing that many employees, they're thinking about how to make this a more equitable region, um, you know, in terms of employment and leadership within those companies. Uh, the Greater Milwaukee Foundation, which of course uh, has a heavy focus on racial equity in this community. And then finally, MMSD, which, which does not get the credit it deserves under Kevin's leadership for focusing on workforce as well as um, uh, equity in the contracting space. Base. They're truly one of the leaders uh, in this community on that work. And, and we at the city, um, it, it's a focus of ours as well, has been for some time, but I, I like to think there's been a renewed focus uh, over these last couple of years, Coinc you know, coincidentally coincides with my time at the Department of City Development, but then also uh, May Mayor Johnson, uh, it's a huge focus of his to ensure that this is a city that is truly equitable for all. And so, um, you know, Catherine, you stole a little bit of my thunder talking housing. I thought I was gonna be the one to throw the curveball and talk housing, uh, but, but she's absolutely right um, that housing has to be a critical component of how we think about infrastructure, um, how we think about making this uh, a community, a city that not just achieves that, that need that the, the mayor talks about for growing our population here, but making sure that everyone can truly participate fully um, you know, in all the different activities uh, that the city has to offer. And so when we think about those 32,000 additional units of affordable housing that we need, 32 2,000 additional black and brown homeowners. Uh, we want to be very aggressive about utilizing not just the $40 million of uh, ARPA dollars we've put into this, but what else can we do on the infrastructure side? And when, when you build that additional housing, when you make sure there's housing available uh, for everyone, you're certainly going to need a lot of people to manufacture the equipment to get that done. You're going to need people who are uh, building those projects. And you're also going to create the kind of stability in people's lives that allow them, again, to go out and participate and, um, you know, that will Im impact our educational achievement and everything else. If you don't have housing stability, I, I don't think anything else really works. No, it's a, it's a great point, and we hear it all the time. I mean, what's nice about working in infrastructure, it's intersectional or interdisciplinary. Pick a different interword. It's probably got it somehow. Um, and, and that's why everyone can kind of comment on it, and their, their perspective really matters, and it tends to be on point. Um, I, I do want to come back to the, the challenges that you brought up. Um, you know, one of the nice things also about talking about infrastructure is it's the complaint department is always open, uh, right? Whether it's congestion on the highways, someone wants light, traffic lights synced up better, the water gets shut off, right, or whatever it might be. Um, but we know that there's kind of more structural issues below that. So, um, you know, I, just so everyone knows, I, I've made it sure when, when I moderate, I really like to make sure that it's a, a conversation. So I want to throw something out to the group. Everyone can kind of jump in here. Um, uh, Ken, we might want to start with you because it's kind of on your beat and you, you started already talking about this, but um, what are some of those physical structural deficiencies that you all hear about, right? This, this is what you've having a panel like this. You'll kind of have different folks both as an individual but also groups that you represent. What are you hearing the most about that, as Amy mentioned too, as an older industrial city, it, it just kind of emphasis on old, right? There's older systems around. The mayor even talked about it. Um, what are those kind of physical systems that are really in need of repair that are getting in the way of that kind of long-term competitiveness? Start at me. Please. Well, you know, um, so I focus on the sewer system. I focus on drinking water as well, although it's not my utility, but it's all interrelated. And it really, for me, we need to make these improvements in the neighborhoods with sewer projects. We see sometimes that we have uh, uh, 
cave-ins where a sewer will fail because it's old, it's not been maintained, it's in bad shape. So we really need to address that, that basic fundamental need of individuals to have clean drinking water but then have a place for that water to go and to, to take it out of the area. When I think of uh, infrastructure, I really think of quality of life. We're really trying to improve the lives of the people that live in these neighborhoods, whether that's a street or a water project or whatever. And although the money's divided up in these different pots, they all interrelate. I mean, you can des design a street that's a complete street, which the mayor was talking about, that will also manage stormwater. And you wanna make it so that when these downpours that he talked about where you, the streets were flooded, you wanna have it where that water is managed where it falls. You wanna make a greener na uh, neighborhood for these urban settings. There's some graph in your report that says 80% or 86%, I think it is, of the population is gonna be in urban areas or is in urban areas. So that's a challenge, but it's an opportunity as well because when you're addressing climate change and you're addressing aging infrastructure, you can concentrate those investments in these neighborhoods. Yeah, great. What other complaints are you all, are you all dealing with? I don't know if it's a complaint. I, I, I think about the answer that S Secretary Rumfeld gave about the known knowns, the known unknowns, and the unknown unknowns. And I think about the unknown unknowns, and I want to kind of turn back to Kevin on this, because one of the things I'm concerned about is what we don't know, right? And there was a project that Kevin came to us about a year or two years ago, and I think it's the most undersung project that, I, that MMSD is going to do in the next five years. We didn't know a thing about it. Um, and Kevin, I want to turn it back to you to talk about it because I think it has an impact on the infrastructure of this community and its water quality for years to come. But we didn't know about it and we didn't know a solution was there. And Kevin said, look, we have an answer to this. We just can't get through the legislature. Can you help us? So Kevin, why don't you talk about it? Because I think it's a great example of a partnership and also dealing with something that we all recognize as a problem, but we weren't addressing. Thanks, Tim. And I went to Tim first, and he was the first one to catch on to this, how important it will be. Uh, we've got an area, if you walk outside, you look at the rivers, they look beautiful. You know, it's nice, clean water, you think, and it's just a pretty area. But on the bottom of those rivers, because we're an old industrial city, is contaminated soils, there's, con there's all types of PCBs, PAHs, anything that you want to think is a pollutant, it's down there. So it's been sitting there for 100 years, 150 years, and we now have an opportunity working with the, uh, the State Department of Natural Resources and the Environmental Protection Agency to dredge those pollutants out of the Inner Harbor area and store them in a location that's safe for the environment, safe, safe for people. And it'll also add 42 acres of land on the uh, lakefront for the city and the Port Authority to develop. So it's, um, it's kind of a win-win for everything. But you don't think about it. You see these fish advisories where you can't eat the fish during certain times of year. Now, I'm not going to promise you'll be able to when this is done, but it'll be a lot safer and the risk will be a lot lower. So we're going to spend the next eight years. Uh, MMSD is building the storage facility for those contaminants. The EPA will then come in and dredge the material out of the bottom of the rivers and place it in this facility. And then it'll take 20 or 30 years for that material to settle and then the city, the Port of Milwaukee, will come along and utilize that land even for either for open space or for port activities. So it, it's gonna be an economic boon for the area, it's gonna be a quality of life boon for the area, and it's just gonna help the entire state. So it's a, it is a, um, a, ch a legacy project that we are um, probably about a year away from construction on. And um, back to your question, because hearing D Tim talk about it, you know, when I started at the district um, 20 years ago, everyone was focused on CSOs, combined sewer overflows. You're dumping poop into the lake. But those only occur about once or twice a year. But every time the river flows into the lake, it's carrying pollutants to it. So one of the things we've tried to do, and I think we're starting to be successful on, is refocus the discussion. If we only got limited dollars, let's put those dollars where they're gonna improve the environment the most, protect water quality the most. And I'm not going to say I support a CSO, but I'll have a combined sewer overflow if I have to, to keep water out of people's basements. But that's that discussion where you always hear, oh, you got to do more about this, you got to do more about this, you got to do more about this. But that's not the problem. You have to focus the discussion on the problem. Yeah, and I, I love the idea of the project. I mean, that's really what's so fast about infrastructure. You're investing 
in a way where it, it actually is for your kids, right? Sometimes these projects take 20, 30 years to show their benefits, neighborhood redevelopments too. Um, Catherine, you, I, I know you're really into citizen voice, so I, I mean, I, sometimes infrastructure is physical, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on that too. Sometimes it's personal though too, right? Are, are, are people being heard in what they want in their communities too? Uh, that's a great question, and actually I'm gonna pick up from Kevin's last comment about when basements flood, because what we do hear is from residents who live in some of the older neighborhoods where the infrastructure maybe hasn't been kept up or is invested as much, when there are sewer overflows or there's basement flooding, it has a disproportionate impact on families, low-income families, who if their freezer goes out, their fridge goes out, and they lose uh, anything, all the food they've had in there, it, actually, it is a significant impact on those families. So we do hear a lot about that, um, those, those types of um, uh, incidents that really do hit families' pocketbooks significantly. The point about um, infrastructure and where we also hear it is that community residents feel really disconnected from the decision making. And so a lot of projects are happening in and around their neighborhoods that, you know, trucks show up or other types of equipment show up and there's stuff that's starting to happen and they're just not aware of it. And so they feel very disconnected and they feel very disempowered from prioritizing and decision making. So, um, you know, one of the things we've, we're investing, we're doing a $100 million investment refurbishing the old Gimbo Schuster's building on King Drive, it's called Thrive on King. Um, before we started that project, we spent a lot of time and we continue to spend a lot of time with residents from around the neighborhood, asking them what they want and what they don't want. Uh, in that first floor, we've dedicated and are underwriting the entire first floor to respond to community residents' desires. It's a start and it's a drop in the bucket, but I can tell you that that conversation has felt very different. I think it's also influenced the way some other projects and some other public and private entities are engaging with residents as they're thinking about moving into different neighborhoods. Lastly, I'll just add on to that because we were talking about housing and hearing from residents. The um, threat of displacement as neighborhoods get rebuilt or investments in infrastructure come into places and really make it so that other investment can follow. There's a lot of displacement that's happening and people are really concerned about it. And so thinking as we have this grand vision for investments, as that being part of the solution on the front end, I think will serve our, our city well to be thinking that forward uh, about that issue. Just add something um, there about that that citizen voice. Um, it is it, it's so critical to doing things the right way and making sure that there there is buy-in from those who are going to be impacted. But I'll go back to the issue of housing stability. If you don't have a stable housing situation, you think about a hierarchy of needs. Um, talking to alders, talking to foundations, talking to whomever about what's going to happen in a particular neighborhood that you may not live in a week from now is not going to be your priority. You may also not have the time to focus on those issues because you're worried about where you're going to be, worried about where where's your kid going to be in school, how are you going to get the kid to school if you move to a different area. And so we have to create that stability in people's lives so that they can contribute more and, and pay attention uh, to the broader issues that are impacting them. Yeah, it was great. Um, I, I want to, a key theme came up, and, and, and Tim, you basically practiced it, talking about partnerships, right? Um, we heard from the, both the mayor and then now you all that, you no, know, you can't do this alone, right? I mean, these projects are big. The planning efforts behind them are in some ways even longer and bigger. Um, talk a little bit about how you all, maybe I can start with you, uh, Commissioner, uh, how, how you're thinking about partnering with whether it's across city agencies, maybe it's with the county, maybe it's with the state, right? Um, other folks in, 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 in kind of your civic communities or across governments. How are you all thinking about partnerships in this space going forward? Yeah, um, I mean, it, it's vital, um, you know, whether it be, uh, you know, as the mayor has talked about and Tim's been, you know, a, a part of this as well, working with the state on, on how Milwaukee gets its fair share uh, of shared revenue so we can do some of the, you know, have our level of services not decline and, and maybe provide uh, additional services and assistance that, that our citizens, uh, that our residents, I should say, could, could utilize. Uh, but it's also thinking about things like, like Kevin mentioned, that, that dredged materials management facility that is actually going to create 
new space to do things on. I mean, we, that, that's something you don't get an opportunity to do uh, very often is create new space to for either for additional port activities or more development. I think about um, the potential uh, for um, altering what's happening with Wisconsin 175 um, out, of the, out of the stadium into uh, Washington Heights, uh, you know, Washington Park area. That's something that the state has been uh, thinking about, that people in the city have been advocating for for some time. And that also, if that happens, if we r remove highway there and um, create, uh, you know, an at-grade boulevard, what is that going to do? It's going to, you know, ameliorate some of the things that infrastructure decisions in the past did to divide our community. It's going to bring different parts of the community together, but it also opens up more space, potentially more housing, potentially more gathering spaces, um, using infrastructure, but also using those partnerships to get things done. And, and the last thing I'll mention is kind of, um, you know, partnerships within city government. Um, you know, one of the first things that I was uh, tasked to do when I when I started, uh, Mayor Johnson, who was then President Johnson, had um, introduced legislation to ensure that the city um, had kind of an interagency housing plan. Uh, so we're working with partners like the Greater Milwaukee Foundation and others uh, on this this housing work. But it starts with inside of the city, us all kind of rowing in the same direction. So Eco Office was mentioned earlier. Got Eric back there. You know, City Gym. Um, who uh, you know is thinking about as we build additional housing, as we think about you know plopping new buildings down, you know how how do we do that in a way that is sustainable? How do we do that in a way where it is thinking about years from now? I think you you need those partnerships so that you don't have blind spots, you, you don't miss the things uh, that are not necessarily what you're thinking about. You know, we've a, a whole lot of the folks within my department um, certainly care a great deal about the environment. You know, we, we took a poll of where they stand on various political issues. Let me be clear, like they're going to be very strongly, you know, pro-environmental policies, but it doesn't mean that in the day-to-day, -day, the work that we're doing, that can be their top focus. And that's why we need those partnerships within city government, where there are people uh, and departments and leaders like Eric who are focused on those things. You know, I, I'm pretty excited about our downtown um, 2040 plan that we're working on, where we're asking people to envision what should downtown Milwaukee look like, say, 20 years from now. And then I come here and I see you guys are thinking about 2050. And I think, you know, it's like, okay, we, we got, got some more work to do. And I know Eric and his team are thinking about even further down the road. And so you need those partnerships so that you don't miss things. Yeah, absolutely. Others, yeah. yeah I mean, I guess I, I think about this at another level even, that if we're going to execute on a lot of this infrastructure across the United States and we're going to stay globally competitive, that we have to come together, and it's going to sound sappy, but we got to come together better as a country. Yeah. And so, you know, we're a drop in the bucket, but we've had our lobbying team for the last couple of weeks in D.C. trying to push our congressional delegation to get on board with the CHIPS Act. Yeah. Now, we don't have any chips manufacturers here. Could you explain I'm, what the CHIPS Act is really quick? Just yeah, in case. Sure, it's a, it's a $52 billion incentive package for um, onshoring the manufacture of chips, which are in about everything. And so I look at our members around the room, um, they all use chips. Um, I had a local company here that was paying 70 cents a chip uh, for thousands of chips. They're now paying 110 bucks for that chip. So if we're gonna make progress, we've gotta come together as a country, state by state, and say, well, maybe we don't have chip manufacturers here, but we have a lot of companies that use them. That's a, a, an intuitive part about uh, developing the infrastructure, a lot of it. We only make 12% of it, and I just look at how much of it's under threat, whether it's in Russia or China or other places. And so this is an opportunity for us to come together as a business community, as a country, and start to put um, a collective willpower behind these investments or we aren't going to be able to competitively invest in the infrastructure improvements, um, whether they're, you know, roads, whether it's digital, um, or whether it's water, um, not much is used without a chip today. And so I think about that from the standpoint of getting through Washington and I think about this old Steelers wheel song, clowns to the left of me, jokers to the right, here I'm stuck in the middle. We've got a lot more people stuck in the middle to move this stuff forward. Catherine, Kevin, I, I think, well, here's, I want to frame the question to you to a little bit this way. Both of you use a different word, but it's kind of the same thing, right? Me metropolitan, greater. But it kind of def 
essentially says, look, where the jurisdictional lines of the city of Milwaukee stop, right, you, you don't. Um, so speak a little bit about how you work across jurisdictional lines, whether formally or just building up partnerships to kind of get some of your work done. Well, go ahead. You go ahead. <laughs> um, I don't look at political boundaries. I look at watershed boundaries. Water does not stop at the city limit. It does not stop at a suburban limit. And for me, I treat everyone the same in that fashion. I, I focus the discussion on the science. I focus the discussion on proving uh, quality of life for the in individuals. And um, I look for partners on that approach. Um, Dean Amhaus is here from the Water Council. They've been a great partner for us by helping us to find new technologies. We're testing one at one of our treatment plants right now that will make us more climate resilient moving forward as if this works, and I think it will. So you look for partners and you take and Tim's kind of saying this, you take the politics out of it. The infrastructure law passed because it was bipartisan. Everyone wants bridges and roads and sewers and water. Um, they need these things, so you try to get past the uh, partisan bickering and talk about what we all want to either protect or do. In our case, we focus everything on Lake Michigan. I'll come back to the human capital side of this, which is the partnership that the Greater Milwaukee Foundation has forged with the Medical College of Wisconsin and Royal Capital Group to redevelop the building I mentioned. Thrive. It's, the name of it is Thrive on King, and while it's a, the building symbolizes our partnership, the partnership within the building and within the neighborhood really are focused on health, health equity and social determinants of health and investments that we're making with the medical college and with other partners throughout the area who are looking at addressing housing, economic stability, um, food, um, health, mental health. And so, um, you know, the mayor said, we can't do this alone, none of us can do this alone, and certainly not in the space that we're talking about. So we um, are constantly working on partnerships, and it takes a lot of time, and it takes a lot of willingness to put, um, you know, some priorities aside so that you can develop those shared priorities. A great example of that, I think actually the Greater Milwaukee Foundation has had a partnership with every institution up on this stage over the years in different ways, whether it's around workforce development, equity, um, the housing work. I mean, we do a lot with the city right now around housing. So for us to advance any of the work that we're talking about, it definitely has to be done through the partnerships. That's great, please. Yeah. Real quick comment. Um, and I'll pick on uh, one of one of the other folks who are here. So, uh, read a great story about Husco um, and the work you're doing with uh, some of the Afghan refugees and getting them out to Waukesha. Some of them, some of them in Milwaukee, getting them out there uh, to work and you know, uh, busing them out. Working with another local company, Manpower, to make that happen. Milwaukee benefits not just from businesses that are in the city of Milwaukee, but businesses that are in our region. And we don't have to spend all our time here talking about what uh, a better regional transportation network would mean for, for all of uh, our, our different uh, companies here and what it would mean for the workforce as well. But we can't you know, lose sight of or shun what's happening with, with other companies in the region. I you know, a uh, great working relationship with MMAC, with M7, um, and one of the things that I um, you know, I've impressed upon uh, uh, them is that if you have a business that's thinking about being in this region, but they have ruled out the city of Milwaukee, They're, they want to be somewhere else for whatever reason, but they want to be nearby, and it can have an impact on our